स्पीच मेड बाय मार्टिन लूथर किंग इज वन ऑफ द मोस्ट ब्यूटिफुल एंड पावरफुल स्पीच इज इट्स a poetic speech in a way and we have gone through only the uh, initial part of the speech there still remains quite a large part of the speech so let's go through it again also but there is something that i must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice now he is addressing the audience the people and obviously the majority of those people are in black there So he says that those who are standing there must listen to him because he thinks that they are standing on the warm threshold. A threshold is a doorway. A threshold is a doorway. The way that leads you into a room. to a hall that is called threshold so he says that and the word threshold metaphorically also means very close very near so he wants to say that this protest this demonstration has brought them very close to achieve their goal it will ultimately lead them into the palace of justice they will be able to get justice in the process of gaining a rightful place we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds however martin luther king is a very scrupulous very conscientious very careful leader he believes in peace and peaceful struggle he warns his people that though their struggle is right their demands are right however they must not become guilty of wrongful deeds they must not perform they must not uh, they must not uh, attempt wrongful deeds what he wants to say is that they have gathered there to uh, get their demand fulfilled to get their rights but in doing so they are not supposed to do something harmful to others let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hate very beautifully he says well we are thirsty for freedom we want freedom but freedom doesn't mean to deprive others of their rights 
he wants to say that his people mustn't become bitter mustn't become hateful mustn't try to commit any wrong to others we must follow our conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline he says that their struggle must be conducted must be carried out on the high plane on the high level of dignity and discipline their struggle must continue with dignity and in a disciplined way in an organized way we must not allow our creative protest to degenerate into physical violence he calls his protest creative it is creative in the sense that he believes he hopes that as a result of this protest they will be able to get their rights and it will be creativity in that sense those who are who have been deprived of rights will get rights so it will create something new in society and in that way their protest is creative but he warns them that this protest this creative protest is not to degenerate to degenerate to go lower and lower to to become uh, 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 to become lowly into physical violence it must not change in a low way into physical violence into some violent some harmful deeds again and again we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force he says well physical force may be used against us of, of course the police may take take action against us the police may use physical force but he advises his people to use soul force force of the soul spiritual force to to defend themselves and this use of spiritual force will be the majestic height the very honorable height majestic dignified heights uh, from where they will be struggling the marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the negro community must not lead us to a distrust of all white people marvelous wonderful very powerful new militancy militancy is basically use of force militancy use of force and it also means rebellion revoltedness so this revolutionary force this rebellious force this rebe rebellious soul that the black people have attained is really very wonderful which has engulfed the negro community which has encircled the negro community must not lead us to the distrust however in this rebellious spirit we are not to
become doubtful of all white people. We are not to lose trust or confidence in our white brethren. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. And he points out that many white people are very sympathetic to the Negro cause, to the Negro mission. And its evidence, its proof is that many of them are present there uh, on the spot. And they have realized, they have understood that their fate, their destiny, their fate is closely linked with, tied up, linked with the destiny, the fate of the black people. And they have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. And they have also realized that basically the freedom of the white and the freedom of the black is the same. Their freedom is inextricably, inextricably, inalienably. That can't be, that can't be detached, that can't be isolated, that can't, can't be estranged, inextricable, bound to our freedom. It is bound, it is very strongly linked or tied to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And the fact is, that neither the white people nor the black people can win their real freedom alone. As we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall march ahead. So as we are walking, we must take oath. We must make the pledge. The pledge is oath. The pledge is very strong promise. So we must make a strong promise that we shall march ahead. We shall march forward. We cannot turn back. Now is no time to turn back. We can't go back. We are to march ahead and ahead, forward and forward. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? Yes. There are certain people, certain circles, certain elements in the American society who are always asking this question, who are asking the devotees. Devotees are the devoted people, very sincere people, those who are struggling for some cause. So, those who are struggling for civil rights, there are some people who ask them, when will you be satisfied? Because, to some extent, some rights have been given to the black people. So, there are people who want, who ask this irritating question, satirizing question, when will you be satisfied? Why don't you get satisfied now? You have got this right and that right. So what's problem now? Why are you not satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. But Martin Luther King makes it very clear. He says, no, we can't be satisfied so long as the black people are the victim of the unspeakable, unspeakable, indescribable, that can't be stated, that can't be spoken of. So, police brutality, police 
police uh, uh, brutality is atrocity so cruelty so as long as police brutality police atrocity and police uh, cruelty is going on the negro people can't be satisfied we can never be satisfied as long as our bodies heavy with the fatigue of travel cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities he says that we have been struggling for a very long time now and during this travel of struggling we have now become tired our bodies have become tired heavy with the fatigue fatigue is a feeling of tiredness so our bodies have become now completely tired and even then we are not given the right to stay to gain lodging to stay in the motels of the highways in those days many motels and hotels didn't allow the black people their doors were shut to the black people so martin luther king is pointing to that fact he says that unless those motels and hotels are open to us we can't become satisfied we cannot be satisfied as long as the negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one another thing he points out here is that it is impossible for them to become satisfied because the progress that is usually propagated the pro- the progress in case of negro the developmental plans of negro are not more than moving them from a smaller ghetto to a larger one a ghetto is basically a an underdeveloped part of a city ghetto and underdeveloped part uh, ghettos were usually for the jews in western europe where jews uh, were discriminated against uh, there were certain parts of the city which were devoid of uh, basic needs uh, where jews were concentrated so the same thing was being done with the black people in america they were put in underdeveloped parts so slums ghetto is slum of so the only progress the only development that can be seen in case of uh, negroes is that from smaller ghettos from smaller slums they are moved to some somewhat larger slums so that's no development we can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for white song say that it's really very irritating it's really very disturbing it's really a uh, very uh, uh, very soul uh, soul uh, killing that black children have been stripped off have been deprived of have been uh, have been uh, uh, have been made uh, clear off their self their self food has been snatched away from them and they have been robbed of their dignity and their dignity have also been stretched by signs because 
On different places, there are signboards on which these words are written for whites of that this place, this, this hotel, this park, this school is reserved only for the whites. Black people are not allowed there. So this treatment has taken off, this treatment has stripped uh, the children of their selfhood and dignity. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. In America, there are different states. At that time, only some, some states had given the right of voting to the black people. For example, in New York, the black people had the right to vote. But in Mississippi, another state, the Negro was not given that right. So he is pointing out that fact. He says, well, in some states, the Negro is deprived of the vote to right, uh, the right to vote. And in some states where they have the right to vote, they don't have any plans, they don't have any policies, they don't have any candidate for whom or for which they are interested in voting. No, no, we are not satisfied. So it's a fact that the black people are not satisfied. And we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. He's, again, he, he becomes poetic here. He says, well, satisfaction can't be achieved. Satisfa satisfaction can't be gained until justice rolls down like water. Until justice flows, flows uh, freely. Justice flows for all like water. And righteousness like a mighty stream. And righteousness Righteousness is holiness. Righteousness is uh, good deeds, right deeds. Unless right deeds are also offered in case of the black people. I am not unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Now he is again addressing the black people. He says that he knows, he is not unmindful, he is not oblivious of the fact. He has not forgotten the fact that some of those people, those black people have gathered there after great trials. They have come there after a lot of difficulties. Trials are tests. So they have come there after great difficulty and tribulations. Tribulations are again testing times, testing situations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jails, jail cells. Even some of the participants, some of the gatherers had come just, uh, just from jail cell. They were put into jails and they have just uh, got their freedom. Some of you have come from areas where your quest for freedom left you better by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. And he points out that some of the people, black people, have come from different cities, different states, uh, and in those cities and states, their quest, their struggle, their 
search for freedom uh, has left them better, has left them broken, has left them shattered by the storms of persecution because there they have to meet persecution, persecution, uh, cruelty, cruel treatment and staggered by the winds of police brutality. They are treated unjustly in an unfair way, very brut uh, br brutally uh, and staggered and their, their speed has become uh, uh, decreased because they are staggering. They, uh, they, uh, they are unable to walk steadily. They are staggering uh, because of the winds of police brutality. Because uh, on different spots, at different places, they had to uh, face cruelty of police. You have been the veter veterans of creative suffering. But he satisfies them, but he encourages them, telling them that they have gone through the experience of such atrocities, such brutalities, such persecution, and in that way they have become veterans. The word veteran is used for some experienced person, a person who has got uh, the experience of a certain field and this word is specially used for those soldiers who have gone through the experience of war. So he says that you have become uh, the veterans experienced persons of creative suffering. Even their suffering is creative because ultimately this suffering is to be, uh, is to be translated into some new creative, uh, some new world where the black people will have equal rights. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. And he advises them to continue their struggle, to march forward with a faith that unearned suffering, unearned suffering undeserved suffering, the suffering that they don't deserve because they haven't committed any crime. They are just demanding their rights, but they are to suffer at the hand of uh, the police and other, uh, other parts. So he says, well, keep in mind that such suffering, such undeserved suffering is always redemptive. It is always rewarding. It brings reward. Ultimately, you will be rewarded with freedom. So, for the time being, we stop here. We'll continue the lesson in our next lecture. Thank you very much.